Hello there, my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Anyone who's spent time visiting game furs, particularly those featuring fly casting and tying demonstrations, must have come across Dr Malcolm Greenhalgh, in whose company I am here today on the banks of a very blustery autumnal river hodder. Similarly, when browsing the angling sections of bookstores and magazine racks. All important components in earning a crust after your abandonment of teaching to take up full-time fishing the best part of 30 years ago. Fly Fishing and Fly Tying magazine editor Mark Bowler, whose magazine you regularly contribute to these days, has described you as a reservoir of knowledge, not only on the fishing scene, but also a wide range of peripheral topics, and in particular, those relating to wildlife. So talk us through your early formative years and the range of contributing strands which have brought things to where you find yourself today. It's strange because I was born right in the middle of the cotton town of Bolton. And in fact I pass where I was born occasionally going to the markets of Lancashire. And I think, Lord, was I really born in that terraced house up that street? And I was, but fortunately my father who worked in the cotton industry at the time the cotton industry was dying in the late 40s and 50s, decided that he was going to move. And so he got a job in Lancaster, we moved to Lancaster, we were there a few months, and then we moved to a little town called Kirkham between Preston and Blackpool. Now, we lived there right on the country edge of town. I could hear cuckoos and tawny owls from the back bedroom window where I slept. And that, together with a pal who I made there, who was a wildlife idiot, he and I spent all our childhood round Kirkham, catching roach, little tench, little perch in ponds, trying to catch rabbits with snares and not doing, and became country boys. So from being born in real towny circumstances, I became a country kid. And then Cotton died and the cotton mill in Kirkham closed. My father needed a job and during the war he'd been in the RAF and he'd been trained as a mechanic in the RAF. So he applied for a job and got a job at BAC factory, Dick Kersick was called in Preston on Stram Road, and we moved to Preston. And that was the thing, we moved to north of Preston in a big house with a huge garden. So my passion for gardening took off there. I grow a lot of fruit and veg now, but I'll tell you no more, because all you're interested in is fishing, that boring subject. And on my doorstep was the River Ribble. So I could potter down to the River Ribble, instead of these little ponds, and there I could catch chub after chub after chub after chub. Now, this is a true story, you'll like this. When I was at Kirkham, we used to buy tiny little gilt hooks to gut, a fish little quill float for our roach and whatever. But that wasn't good enough for the old chub. And I got down to the river, the first time I ever fished the River Ribble at Church Deeps at Preston, to discover that I'd forgot my hooks and I'd got one hook to gut so I had these new hooks with eyes that I could tie to the line I'd left at home so I didn't know what to do and then I noticed another guy sitting on a basket and I walked down to him this early Saturday morning I said to him excuse me but I've left my hooks at home except for this one which isn't good enough for chub he said nay lad that's not good enough for chub now I want some of these and he opened this basket and I pulled out this little box and in it were hundreds of hooks and he gave me a pinch of hooks. So I thanked him profusely, and then when I got back to my little chair where I was sitting by the dirty I realised why he'd given them me. They were, in fact, seconds. They were not perfect hooks, because they had no eye. They had this little flat bit at the end of the shank, uh, which I'd never seen that before. I mean, now we know they're called spade ends. And there is a special knot called the spade end knot, but Malcolm didn't know that in those days. So, with the aid of time and perseverance, I managed to granny hook one of these spade enders to there and chuck some bait in and I caught my first chub. But uh, that was the, the start of it all, I suppose. Now, I knew about fly fishing. Nobody in my family fished, except a distant uncle who was a great quarter fisherman in Bolton. Nobody fished. But in fact, when I was a, a lad, I was 13 years old, I was down by the River Ribble and I saw somebody fly fishing and I have never seen anything so beautiful in the fishing world in all my life. When you see a fly being cast with this quite thick line, which is the weight to 
carry the flag, with these great sweeping curves of the line and the rod and the line going back and forward and then out. I thought that was the most stunningly beautiful things I'd ever seen. And there and then I determined that I was going to be a fly fisherman. And eventually, with the help of a tattle dealer called Cyril Calderbank, we're a tattle shop in Preston. He was a teacher and he had the tattle shop as a sideline. Dead now, dear old Cyril. Wonderful man. He put me together some old fiberglass bits and pieces and I made a rod and got a cheap reel and a cheap line, learned to cast and became a fly fisherman. Now, I was lucky in that I knew family at Ribchester in the Rubble Valley who had their own fishing. Nobody fished it except the vicar, the local vicar at Ribchester and I could fish there and that's where I really learnt to fly fish. Now I didn't have much time because academia, I'm afraid, and wildlife was a great influence. But I used to go up there occasionally with this fly rod and I could not catch a fish to save my life. Before I went, the night before, I used to get some cornflake packing, cut the cornflake packing up into squares and wrap leaders to tie the flies on and because it was north country I read the books about it you had to have three flies on flies like orange partridge water blower snipe and purple dark watch it really ancient flies and I tied the flies on and so I went to the river with say 10 casts already made up with the flies on and I'd start off and put a leader on with the flies on and after two half casts take it off put that tangle away and by lunchtime I was got by neither that I was tying new ones I was hopeless but I enjoyed the thought that I, one day I'll be able to do this. And then I could shake to the exact place it is. As a little ditch comes into the Ribble near Oswald Leston Hall. My wet flies came round. Something grabbed hold. And I caught my first ever chub on a fly. And I've still got the fly that I caught it on. I wish I'd still got the chub. I didn't want to put it back, but I did. It was such a beautiful chub. It must have weighed at least three quarters of a pound which as people who know Chubb think that's a baby one. And it was magic. And that's how it all started. Now, let me say that people who listen to this may be fishermen and they may have heard a little bit about me as a fisherman. But fishing is only part of my life and always has been. I say from being 13 years old, I've been a keen gardener. And in fact, I nearly went into horticulture. I had to make a decision when I was 18. Is it going to be zoology and natural history? Or is it going to be horticulture? And I chose the natural history side. The thing was that besides fish and fresh water, I am obsessed with birds, especially estuary birds. And the one advantage of living at Preston was the fact that below Preston are some of the finest salt marshes and mud flats for birds in the world. And I can say that without anybody disagreeing because, for example, the widgeon, which is a wild duck if you don't know widgeon, widgeon population of the Ribble Estuary in winter has reached 100,000. There are visitors from all over Scandinavia, Siberia and so on. And that is the largest duck flock in Europe, if not the world. And that's on the River Ribble below Preston. And so I was very lucky in that I also studied the salt marshes, the mud flats and the birds and then the, what the birds were feeding on and so on. And so having finished my first degree at Lancaster, which I, I was very, very idle and did a lot of natural history and a bit of fishing then, I was asked if I'd do a PhD on the Ribble Estuary, which I did, and I studied the wading birds of the Ribble Estuary and what they ate. And of all the time, that sort of brought me more and more into contact with the invertebrates that live in rivers, whether it's estuary or the freshwater of rivers because I had to know all about the little snail called Hydrobia, which a lot of wages feed on, and so on. And so that side became more and more important, and it, then it linked up to the fishing side. You see, when I was at Lancaster in my first degree, we did a course called The Biology of Lakes with a gentleman called Dr T.T. T. McCann, who was the great freshwater ecologist. And T.T. T. McCann got me to look at all these things that trout eat, which I'd heard about, things like March browns, olives, stoneflies, and so on. And so at the side, besides the bird and the estuary, and my fishing, I had linked, you see, with the natural history, with what the trout were feeding on, the young salmon were feeding on. And so, life became very complicated, in that the whole of the Ribble, 
estuary Ribble Valley became one big research station for me where I spent all my time, my free time, looking at trying to catch trout, finding out what trout were eating and in fact looking at the gut content, still do it, and then back onto the estuary and I still spend a lot of time on the estuary looking at my birds. And so it's that big natural history thing that for me fly fishing is part of and fishing generally. In fact I used to do a lot of course fishing and a few years ago because I caught when I packed up work of which more are none I had a go at catching as many species of European freshwater fish as I could and I did do pretty well as of about eight that I haven't caught and I was talking to the editor of one publisher Mitchell Beasley in London over lunch that they paid for thank goodness those were the days and uh, they said you know would I do a book on European freshwater fish so I said yeah of course I will so they've got a young artist to do the paintings of the fish and we did that you see that's natural history but a lot of the fish that are described in there and also the statistics that I've given on how to identify them precisely using counts of scales and all sorts of weirdo little scientific things is natural history so you see freshwater fishing then was a way instead of using binoculars like a little birds a way of finding the fish in fact one of the crackers was the burbot. Now you see, the burbot used to occur in Britain. It's very common in parts of Scandinavia and I needed to catch one. So that I had handled one, I could confirm that what all the other books had written, copying each other, which is what they used to do, was correct. So I got in touch with a pal of mine and went across in the middle of winter, which is the best time to catch burbot, to ice fish, so a hold of the ice. So at minus 28 degrees centigrade, I was sitting on reindeer rugs in the middle of this frozen lake in the middle of Norway and I caught burbot, which tittled me no end, because an old, old pal of mine called Fred Buller, who did a big book on freshwater in Britain, uh, actually went to Poland to catch a burbot and failed. So I did something that Fred Buller never did, which is catch burbot, several of them. But the best thing about that particular trip, and I like trips like this, is that was getting back. Unfortunately, my flight from Reros to Oslo was cancelled because of fog. So when I finally did get to Oslo, my plane to Manchester had gone. So the girl on the Brathens desk, which was the council plane, said, don't worry, sir, we'll sort it out. And they did. I had to fly to London Heathrow and then back on the shuttle from Manchester. Unfortunately, the only seat they had in the British Airways Heathrow flight was first class. So I was forced to drink a couple of glasses of champagne before we took off, a full bottle of white wine with the cod in the flight, and then, of course, there were a couple of glasses of scotch on the shuttle north. So when I got home an hour late, I was sozzled a few hours late. But to the crazy one then, because nobody had mobile phones and things, I phoned the wife who was working and got a technician. And the technician said, oh, if Yvonne's got a practical class on. So I said to her, well, could you give her a message? Tell her I won't be in Manchester at 5.15. I've missed my flight. Will you tell her I'll be in at 10.15 off the shuttle? And Elaine, the technician, said to me, where are you? I said, I'm in Oslo. She said, you can't be, you're too loud. That's true. One thing I've always enjoyed doing is writing. My first article ever published when I was 17 was about dippers in the Hodder Ribble Valley where we are now. And my first book was on wildfowl, published in 1975, called Wildfowl of the Ribble Estuary. 40 years old, that book now. So writing is something I've always enjoyed doing. And I did some lecturing and I got to the primal age of 39 and it was driving me spare. Red tape, pieces of paper, people wandering around who didn't have proper jobs, call themselves heads of department, say, and all their job was to make job for you much more difficult by messing about. And I'd had enough. So on my 40th birthday, I handed in my notice and said I was quitting. Sylvia, our chief technician, said, oh, you're always joking, Doc. I said, this is no joke, Sylvia. I saw Sylvia the other day, and she was laughing about it. 30 years on, nearly. And so I packed up. And just before I packed up, I wrote two fishing books, both of which were published the year after I packed up. One was called Trout Fishing in Rivers, and one was called Lake Lock and Reservoir Trout Fishing. Now, it just so happens that one of my heroes, who I'll say something about later on, is a guy called Hugh Falkus. Hugh Falkus got Witherby's to publish his big sea trout books. So I sent that book to Tony Witherby. 
And Witherby immediately said, yes, I'll publish it. And he did. And the other one I sent to A&C Black, who did a lot of fishing books. And they said, yes, please, we'll publish that. And they did. And two things happened that were interesting. First of all, I got a telephone call from this guy called Hugh Falkus. Now, it may be that he'd seen a television programme because Look Northwest, which may well have covered the Lake District where he lived, got in touch because they'd heard that some idiot had packed up a reasonable job to spend his time doing wildlife and a bit of fishing. And they did a feature on me on Look Northwest, which the following Christmas they had a vote amongst the public on which was the best featured item and it was repeated because I really enjoyed it about this idiot who slagged everybody off where he'd been working and caught some railing for the television camera he may have heard of that but anyway I got a phone call from Hugh Falkus now Hugh Falkus at the time was making natural history programs for BBC called World About a Series he'd done two fly fishing programs so I got this phone call from Hugh Falkus and Hugh Falkus said to me uh, if I was here, will you come up to Craig Cottage? So I immediately got in the car and went up to Craig Cottage where he lived. It was rather like going to see God. And I went in and he was sitting there at a bread for mica table which appears on his film Salmo the Leaper, which is one of the most popular films ever made by fishermen and seen by millions. And uh, he said to me, right, come into my study. So I went into his study and he said, now then, I'm going to tell you one or two things. I'm so pleased you've given up silly employment to be a writer. But first of all, you'll be immensely happy. And secondly, you'll never be rich. And he's correct. Thirdly, he said, if you ever want any advice or me to be a mentor, please feel free to come up here and you may fish here any time you want, which I did. Finally, he said, would you like a glass of scotch? This was 10 o'clock in the morning. He drank a lot of scotch. And so I had that. And secondly, he was great help. And secondly, because of the two little books I'd done on trout fishing, I got a, a letter from a publisher in London, George Phillip, saying that they were producing a book called The Wild Trout. It would be a collection of paintings by a guy called Rod Sutterby of trout, but they wanted somebody to do a text to go with it, and they hadn't found anybody suitable. So I said, yes, I'd be interested. So I got on the train. This is the year after I packed to work, 1987. So I got on the train down to London and met John Gaysford and he told me what about and we talked about what the book could do in the format and it would involve me travelling to North America to catch some trout to bring back for Rod to paint and so on and uh, I could cope with going to America catching a few trout and that sort of thing and then he took me out to lunch and in those days publishers took you out to proper lunches none of this email garbage that we have today none of this over the internet you actually met face to face and you met at 9.30 and at 12.30 you went out to lunch and he took me to a French restaurant in London which was fantastic I had escargot followed by this wonderful duck dish followed by a cheese we had a bottle of claret oh it was phenomenal I thought this is the life and then I had to write the book and we did write the book and it was runner up in the International Conservation Book Prize for 1989 and that was, I think, my biggest break because everybody raved on about that book. I mean, mainly it was Rod's paintings, which was superb, but it did very well and made me a few quid. And later on, we did another book on the Atlantic salmon. Now, those sort of books sell OK, but you've got to churn one of those out a year if you want to make more than, say, in those days, five, six thousand pounds, together with articles, which I'll come back to and make for magazines. But one had to find books that sold more copies and that I did and I did it by pure accident there was a new naturalist series famous new naturalist series by HarperCollins and there was a book in that published by J.R. Harris called An Angler's Entomology and it was really was a bit out of date and needed a lot of updating to it and because it was such a mega book I thought what we need to do is to do an update to that so I contacted HarperCollins and heard very little got a letter back saying yes they'd like to do it they got in touch with J.R. Harris himself who was living in Dublin 91 years old he approved that I would do the book did a format a new format on caddis flies a couple of chapters and they were happy with that and then I heard nothing and what had happened is that the editor Crispin Fisher had died and HarperCollins Natural History had gone downhill a little party and nothing then out of the blue I got a letter from a guy called Michael Walter the letter said would you come down to London, please? 
I need to discuss this because I've gone through all the papers. I'm looking after HarperCollins and bringing it back on its feet. So I went down to London, met Michael Walter, and eventually we had lunch together, as one does. And what Michael said was, if you want to do the, the new naturalist one, you can do it. It'll sell about three copies, which will make about tubs halfpenny. He said, but if you want to do a proper book, do one for me. And so we went to stay in the chateau in France and we hummed and hard about it. And he produced this book called The Fly Fisher's Handbook. And that took two years of writing, took two years of illustrating, illustrated by the number one field guide illustrator, especially entomology, a guy called Dennis Overton. And that book, which describes all the foods of trout, char, grayling and so on throughout Europe, that has charts on when all the, the adults of all these flies hatch and so on, with copious illustrations, that has... 680 flies that imitate all those different foods. I mean, it must have cost thousands to put together, and he paid me a lot of money to in advances. But then he had the ability to sell them around Europe. And so besides there being a British edition, which there had been with trout fishing in rivers and Lock River trout fishing, and in the wild trout, there'd only been a British edition. With them, there was a French translation, a German translation, a Finnish translation, a Danish translation, a Norwegian translation, ad infinitum. And they bought lots more books than Brits did. I mean, I think the first edition German was 10,000 copies. And you were out that's 10 grand to me, rather than sort of two and a half grand for an English book. And then, a few years later, we're going to have to have a second edition, because everything's sold out. So the second edition's done. And again, huge numbers sold, relatively, which makes me serious about money. Now that is the thing you need because British sales don't make money. This idea that if you want to make a serious living out of writing, you've got to have foreign editions came again when I was asked if I would do a book for Mitchell Beasley in Britain, Reader's Digest in America. It was a matter of getting people from all around the world involved and this includes some of the great, great, great names of the world like Lefty Cray and Dave Whitlock and people like that and I produced it in Britain I edited everything up in Britain and then it had to be translated into American to go to America now this gets me you know dear me do we not speak the same language we don't because the Americans don't get things they get them and all this silly translation into American got me but then Harper Collins came along and said because of my interest in freshwater life would I do a guide to European freshwater life now, over the years, I've travelled a lot all over Europe, and I've looked at trout foods all over Europe. And so, Dennis Ovenden and I did this little book called Guide to Freshwater Life of Britain and Northern Europe. And again, in Britain, it wouldn't have made much money. But the fact that you had French, German, and, may I say, even an Estonian edition, which tittle me no end, means that you make a serious amount of money out of it. And that's what you've got to do. So, books, yep. Yeah brilliant but uh, I don't think it's going to last because the internet's killing it Amazon's killing it, the book system is now slowly collapsing and I'm old enough not to worry about it Magazines are an interesting one I started writing magazine articles when I was 17, 16, 17 and when I was in my 30s I used to write for Trout and Salmon, Trout Fisherman Shooting Times, Occasionally Country Life and The Field when I bumped into Hugh Falkus and had Witherby's producing my first book, Trout Fishing in Rivers, both Witherby and Falkus said to me, stop writing articles. And so I stopped writing articles. And then I thought, why the dickens am I not writing articles? Because books are okay, but when a book appears, you get a check and that's it. And you sit around waiting for the next check, which might be another two or three years after you've written the next book. At the same time, though, I got this letter from a guy I knew who used to edit Trout and Salmon, who said, we're starting a new magazine system called Salmon, Trout and Sea Trout, and another little magazine called Fly Fishing and Fly Tying. And so I started writing for them, and that was quite wonderful because every month I wrote for them and not just one article. I had a series of pseudonyms, and one or two people tried to catch me out. So there was, say, Harry Pilling, who there was a famous Lancashire cricketer, Harry Pilling. There was 
all loads of them, about six, seven, eight. And the guy who ran the magazine, who owned the magazine, a few years later, said to me, uh, would phone me up and say, I want an article on sea trout by so-and-so. I want an article on grayling by so-and-so. I want an article on trout by so-and-so. And if you can manage me an article on salmon by so-and-so, I'd be grateful. So I was writing three, four articles a month for salmon trout and sea trout, plus an article a month for Fly Fishing and Fly Time magazine, which was four articles a month, dead easy stuff to do, really enjoyable stuff to do, and getting paid a considerable amount of money for doing it. So it was rather like getting a small salary for doing five days' work. That was brilliant, and I enjoyed it. But in recent years, eventually you finish off saying, I don't want to hack right, I don't want to keep just shouting it out. But what's happened in recent years is that Magazine incomes have fallen. Salmon, trout and sea trout collapsed. Trout and salmon, trout fishermen, perhaps fly fishing and fly tying, aren't making as much money as they would have made years and years ago. So the income from those has fallen. So whereas in the 1980s I was getting paid something like, say, £40 a page for a magazine article, now you might get £40 a page for a magazine article 25 years later. It has fallen. And so the income from magazines has, has collapsed. People are not buying them to the same extent, which is very sad. Anything that lets me chatter to people about natural history or fly fishing is wonderful. Radio, I think, is the perfect medium. I've done quite a bit of television stuff, uh, appearing on bits and pieces. I've made two series of video programmes, which are quite enjoyable to do. But radio is, in my opinion, the perfect medium. And the reason I think it's the perfect medium is that uh, you can elaborate, put little stresses in that the public don't realise. Let me give you an example. I used to do a few programmes with a guy called Martin James, Radio Lancashire's angling correspondent. I used to enjoy doing some of them. And one year we decided to do an April Fool. We went to a friend's house who has a rainbow trout fishery and we got some big hefty bait fish went down to the pond and this is how it went. Martin James. Well, Malcolm, you brought us here to the banks of the River Ribble at the Tiddle Trout, where the M6 crosses the River Ribble at the A59 bridge. I said, yes. He said to catch sturgeon. Is that possible? Oh, yes, said I. You see, what's happened is since the rivers have become clean, sturgeon have started to run the rivers. And the EA are just letting us know that they, they're there now and what we're going to do is we're going to catch one. The first one well, caught in the rule for a long time. Martin James. Well, how do we catch a sturgeon? Well, it's easy, Martin. What we do is we need the... We want to catch the female because the female has the row, which is the caviar. So the female is attracted to the male by the male producing a sex hormone called a pheromone into the water. And so we've got to put something that she will grab the male and make him mate with her, but it's not really the male, it's our hook. Well, I went to Russia and the Russians have so given me several bottles of male sturgeon pheromone. Here's a small bottle, you only need a few drops, and the bait is going to be a loaf of bread. So we also ch -ch -ch -ch, see on the loaf of bread, put a big hook in. Now Frank, what title? Oh, we're using this big whatever it is rod and fortuna reel and a thousand yards of fifty pound line. Right, well cast it in. Splash. This is played Saturday morning, first of April, Radio Lancashire. Now, listeners, says the girl in the Blackburn office, we're going to leave Martin, Malcolm and Frank fishing by the Tittle Trout. Next programme. Then, all of a sudden, Radio Lancashire. Uh, the police have informed us that Malcolm, Martin and Frank aren't actually fishing now. They recorded it last week. So would you please move your cars from the... And we were causing chaos at the M6... A59 Junction by the Tittle Trout. It was wonderful. And that is what you can do with radio. Radio's fabulous. Absolutely magic. I also enjoyed shows. When I started doing this sort of thing, uh, Partridge dragged me in to become part of their family, part of their team. And so I used to go around and we'd do Chats with Angling show, the Game Fair, we did shows in Scotland, we did shows at Broadlands on the River Test, we did shows at Woburn Abbey in Bedfordshire, lots and lots of shows. And my job there would be to tie flies, to talk to people about trout foods with Oliver Edwards, and so on. And I suppose in some years we did eight or ten weekend shows. They were fabulous. In the last ten to fifteen years, shows have completely and utterly collapsed. 
This year I went to the game fair as a guest, which went down for a day, not the full three days. It was abysmal. There were hardly any stands, so if you were a keen fly fisherman, there wasn't much to keep you attracted. I took part in two discussion sessions. Each of them had all of 12 bodies there, some of whom were stand holders who were bored out of their brains. In fishing, it's gone. And the problem is that things are so cheap on the internet that why buy a full price fishing rod at a game fair? Why buy top quality stuff at the game fair when you can get it cheap on the internet? And that's what's happened. In contrast, if you go to the game fair and look at the shooting area, the shooting area is still alive. The reason is you can't buy guns and 12 bore cartridges on the internet. And so companies have stopped doing shows. I'm afraid it's very sad. But whereas at Chatsworth Angling Fair in, say, 1995, there would be possibly a quarter of a million people would go around the show, you wouldn't get 2,000 now. They've just stopped doing them. And that is very, very sad. You can see uh, this decline in publishing, in magazines, fishing magazines. You see it in the shows. And I'm just looking, I was born when I wasn't, was around during the best of it. As I say, I packed up when I was 40 to do what I like to do. One of them is growing fruit and vegetables. One of them is my passion about the county I live in, Lancashire. I mean, my name's Greenhalgh. It's a Lancashire name. Outside Lancashire, you never hear of it. It comes from a castle called Greenhalgh Castle, which Oliver Cromwell kicked around, the swine. Uh, in fact, I wrote to Tony Blair. When Tony Blair was, was apologising for, for slavery, I wrote to him and said, would he apologise and give us a bit of compensation for kicking Greenhalgh Castle around? Or, and he never even replied, the swine. And then there's a little hamlet near Blackpool called Greenhalgh. And so it's something that's been in me, and one of the family got our Greenhalgh back to 1631 in Bolton. We've lived in Bolton, or we lived in Bolton all those years. Lancashire's another area. And the other areas, of course, are the Ribble Valley and Walken Bay, my two favourite places in the whole world. So I've done books on Lancashire food. I've done books on the history of Lancashire, things that have happened in Lancashire. I've done a big book on the River Ribble. I'm doing a book on Walken Bay. I've done a book on growing fruit and veg in Lancashire. Grow your own in Lanx. It's best grown in the northwest, And it is. And in fact, growing stuff in Lancashire is different than growing stuff anywhere else. For example... All the garden books tell you can grow tomatoes outside. You can in Lancashire. The only thing is they don't ripen in Lancashire. And so you've got to be careful of things like that. So, yeah, my interests are wide and very wide. It's, in fact, go back to the birdie thing. I did the introduction for the big new Birds of Lancashire, which is a mammoth tome. And uh, I was a major contributor to the, and editor, of the book we did a few years ago, The Atlas of All Lancashire's Breeding Birds, which was a very, very thorough atlas. So I'm still active in that area and still write about it. Over the years, I've been very, very fortunate in that I've fished lots and lots and lots of places in the world, both for freshwater fish like salmon trout, char and so on, and places for saltwater fish. Let me give you a classic example. Telephone goes. Hello, this is the Brazilian Tourist Board. We wonder if you'd like to come down and fish the River Amazon. We're getting a photographer involved called Barry Ord Clark. We'll organise the flights and accommodation and everything. All you'll have to do is fly down to Sao Paulo from Heathrow and then we fly you up to Manaus. There you'll be picked up by a small plane, taken into a brand new lodge in the middle of nowhere. So, reluctantly, one September afternoon, I got on a plane to Sao Paulo and spent three glorious weeks on different lodges flying in a little plane all over Brazil. It was fabulous. And the fish. Peacock bass. Now some yank wrote a book about peacock bass fishing. He said, when a peacock bass takes, imagine a 40 megaton Irishman exploding under your rod tip. Absolute balderdash. They do take hard. But they're about as good as catching, say, a reasonable-sized sea trout on the River Hodder. They're good fish. Beautiful fish. Very variable. You can get bright yellow ones, bright red ones, greyish ones and so on. But they were great fun. And then we had to go for, with bait, for some of the catfish. If I had my time again, I think I'd study catfish in the Amazon. There are about 15 species. The big one, the Kururu, grows to enormous weight and we went to catch one of these. So I'm sitting in this aluminium canoe thing with a guide who's fishing for bait, dead baits. 
and he's got a little cane rod with a piece of wire, a piece of piece of string, a piece of wire, and a hook, and he's using a bit of dead piranha as bait. So he gets the rod end by the boat, goes slush, slush, slush in the water, lowers the baited hook, and the piranha takes hold. He brings it in, he kills the piranha, gives it to me, I put it on my big hook, cast it out, and I feel it bumping across the river as it comes round under the bank. Bump, bump, and then tweak, 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 reeling, that piranha's been eaten by piranhas. But he's caught another piranha, so you stick another piranha on, cast it out, bump, 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 the ledger come around, tweak, tweak, reel in, that piranha's been eaten by piranhas, and this goes on for about half an hour. Then all of a sudden, instead of the leak, oh, it goes bump, 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 as the ledger comes around the bottom, you feel wallop, brrr, and the rod almost gets pulled in your hand. So, what do you do? The guide goes, clunk, outboard, full whack, into the middle of this Amazonian tributary, thumb on the multiplier to stop the fish taking a line and you get it across and then you start playing it. And as you take your thumb off, the reel goes Zzz! and you get a blister on your thumb. And eventually, eventually, this fish comes in. About 200 pounds of fabulous red, purple, green, blotchy, wonderful catfish. You take a photograph and put it back. Absolutely amazing. 300 miles from the nearest road. Pretty good. But you get some daft ones. I got a phone call. Uh, no, I wasn't. It wasn't a phone call. I was down doing a talk in the Midlands. This guy came up to me. I was getting the pictures ready. My wife was with me. He said to me, uh, you wouldn't come to the West Indies, would you? I said, pardon? This was early January. Filthy, horrible day outside. You wouldn't come to the West Indies in about two or three weeks' time. If I said, come over here, this gentleman's asking me a question, and I need you to be there. I want Malcolm to come to the West Indies in about three weeks' time. Well, she was working. Well, yeah, of course you can go. Obviously I can go. So, flow down to Antigua, little private jet out to this little island called Barbuda. Now, Barbuda, had never, I'd never come across it before. I knew it from his postage stamps, but I'd, I'd never, been, never, never knew anybody there. And I'd contacted some Yankee pals, who I'll mention in a minute, who were great, world-class saltwater fly fishermen and I discovered that none of them had been there nobody had been there but that it had tarpon, permit and bonefish so there I caught tarpon, permit and bonefish wrote the guide the brochure for this guy's hotel he was building on the island it was just being built and flew back having had three fabulous weeks in the sun got back in February a friend of mine looked like a, I'd been a, I was a Kenyan tea planter when I arrived back. He picked me up from the station. The crazy thing is that in the October, it should have opened in November, in the October there was a hurricane. And the hurricane completely wiped it off the face of the earth. So that hotel is no more. They've got a great brochure, but no hotel. Amongst the greats, I mean, saltwater fly fishing is extremely popular. And some of the people who made it popular are some of the great Yanks. Lefty Cray, bless him, one of the funniest and most competent casters of a fly you've ever come across. Wonderful, wonderful man. So famous, in fact, that his famous fly, The Deceiver, actually appeared on an American postage stamp. Then there's another great, great guy, had a cafe in uh, New Jersey called Bob Popovics. He had also really super flies. And then a guy who became a good pal of mine, Ed Jaworowski, who was one of the greatest, greatest casters. He came across to Britain several times demonstrating casting at some of our shows that were great shows in those days, as did Lefty ones. A couple of stories for you about this, because I'm going to talk about tackling it shortly. Ed was across doing the Chats with Angling Fair casting demo, and then he did a little show for a little fishery in Cheshire. And... Uh, as he was doing this casting demonstration, one of the guys who he heard overheard say, yeah, but look at it, he's using sage rods, they're expensive. So Ed stopped and said, hold on a minute, sir. And he walked round to somewhere where somebody was fishing and said, may I borrow your rod? And the rod was a crappy thing. And he picked this crappy rod up and did this immaculate casting. He said, it's not the rod. The same chats with him, in fact, this guy, after he'd done his demo, said to him, yeah, do you know, I think I ought to use sage rods. So I'd said to him, well, what, what do you fish for, sir? I fish for rainbow trout in small still water. So I said, the sevens line would be perfect, yeah? So the rod that Ed had used for his casting demo was presented to this guy. And he sort of flogged it around. And then took the rod and said, sir, you don't want to say his rod, you need casting lessons. 
it's true. Anyway, I'll give you an example of how great it is over there for saltwater fly fishing. Ed told me, we said, you've got to fish Martha's Vineyard. So I went across, flew to Boston. Uh, Ed picked me up. We fished Cape Cod. And then we took the ferry across to Martha's Vineyard. Now, Martha's Vineyard is the island where they made Jaws. It's the island where the Kennedys have their place. It's where President Obama has his holidays. It's a mega, mega place. And so we remember that one of the Kennedys, one of the younger Kennedys, drowned Mary Jo Capetney by driving his car off the bridge. Young Teddy Kennedy. Well, that bridge, which they call the Kennedy Car Wash, is still there, but they've got balustrades either side to stop people driving off. I've caught striped bass under that bridge. And uh, if you remember the film Jaws, Jaws goes into the pond, if you remember, under a bridge, a wooden bridge. Well, I've caught striped bass under that bridge. And once we were there and the light was going and Ed said we could catch some fish in the pond because it's hide hide and we can go so where he just was waded out into the pond and I could hear in the dark this splashing got out there and it was bullfish and bluefish doing fry and it was incredible you just cast a fly a big a big fly well four or five inch long clouds in the middle whopped it out pull pull wallop fabulous fishing absolutely zonking now at one of the shows I go to People often ask me, where, where should they go to catch this? These two guys came up and said, we want to do some saltwater fly fishing. Where's the best place to go? I said, start in New England. Go to either New Jersey or go to Cape Cod. I saw them at the show the following year. Malcolm, you were absolutely spot on right. But it got a bit boring when we were catching so many fish. It's great stuff. And it's, I say, that sort of saltwater fly fishing was pioneered by great people. The thing about the United Kingdom is we don't have the right water. It's too cold. We don't have the big populations of big, big saltwater fish. I mean, our bass, all right, you can catch bass on fly, you can catch mackerel on anything. But it's not quite the same as going in where it's warm, where the metabolic rate of the fish is high, where they hit the fly hard, where you've got clear water. That's another problem we have. We don't have that clear water. Even if you go to, say, Devon and Cornwall, it's not that clear. I mean, in, in the tropics, you can see fish so easily if you're wearing Polaroids. Whereas here you can't do that. And we just don't have them. I suppose that global warming might result in the Ribble Estuary and Morecambe Bay getting bonefish tarpon, but it'll be after my time. Tackle and tactics. Right. One of the great problems is that if somebody doesn't catch, it's either because they've got the wrong fly on or because they've got the wrong rod. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Usually, it is because of their incompetence. I have seen people come to me and said, Oh, if only I had flies as good as yours. Because, I mean, I do tie flies, and they're not too bad. I can give them a fly, they can't catch with it. Sometimes they do, but usually, often they don't. I once had a real joke at Stillwater Rainbow Trout Fishery. All these people were catching nothing, so I was just fishing leaded flies, so I fished, started off with a killer bug, which is just a bit of grey wool tied around with wire around a hook. Got a fish... Gave three anglers either side of me one of those flies and immediately put on a pheasant tail nymph. Caught on a pheasant tail nymph, they came, gave him a pheasant tail nymph each, they didn't catch. Put on a hairy a gold head, caught on one of those, give him one of those each. This was a joke, I did it for a joke, just to show it could be done. Not one of those three guys had a clue how to cast a fly properly to catch a fish or how to control the line in the still water so you could see when a fish had taken. They should have had lessons, but Oh, they're expensive. I'm not paying all that. Oh, you must be joking. And then, when it comes to tackle, there are two sorts. Oh, those rods are expensive. Those are cheap. Sorry, folks. A good rod is worth having. But then you see you get people, and I know one or two of people like this, who, when, take sage rods, which are very, very good fly fishing rods. Expensive in Britain. I'll give you a tip about that in a minute. When Sage bring a new 9 foot for a 5's model out, they trade the old one in that's been 12 months old and buy the new one. That's stupid. I'm still fishing with a 10 foot Sage that takes a 7's line, which I was given by Partridge of Redditch, who were the first importers of Sage into Britain, in 1988. And it still catches sea trout in the River Hodder. There is no need to be constantly changing, changing, changing. Get used to a rod, provided you've, you've been taught how to use it. 
I mean, for me, I took me a year, two years before I was, comp as I taught myself, competent enough to be able to catch fish regularly. If I was starting again at 13, 14, I'd, I'd get lessons. I really would. The other side to it is the leader. People look at rods, oh, that's a great reel, and they look at lines, oh, I'm going to buy Melend, that's stupid, you should buy quality lines, look after them, they'll last for years. Some of the lines I've got on reels are 10, 15 years old and still, I still use them. No need to keep changing. But the leader, which connects the fly line to the fly, is all important. Now, let me give you an example. Supposing you're fishing for sea trout or bass with a fast sinking line. The tendency is for everybody to tie on always a 9 or 10 foot leader. So you tie a 9 and 10 foot leader on, you cast it out, the line sinks because you're fishing a sinking fly line, but unless you've got a weighted fly, the fly is very slowly sinking on the end of this long leader. If you're fishing a fast sinking line, your leader should be a foot two feet long at most. That's all. You don't need it longer. The line in the water won't affect the fish because it's not splashing, it's down at the bottom. It might be in a bit of weed, they've no idea what it is. But they will see the fly at their depth, and that is important. Similarly, if you've got trout in very clear water feeding at the surface, you've got to make sure that you do not disturb those fish with a splashy fly line. So you tie on a nine foot leader, cast out with say a fives line, the fives line lands about five feet or six feet from the fish and puts them down. I fish a 12 foot tapered leader when I'm dry fly fishing with a three or four foot point at the end of it so that my fly line is at least three or four or five yards away from the fly. And that catches me fish. I can quote examples. Somebody said when I wrote about this in one of my books, Floating Fly, some so-called experts said, oh, I think you're wrong. You don't need to be using leaders that long for dry fly fishing. But I've known instances where somebody has tried to catch a fish using a nine foot leader and looked at me in despair and said, well, I can't catch it and I've caught it. And I've caught it because I've been using that long leader in clear water. I've done that many times. And it's not me being clever. It's the fact that I've learned that if I want to catch these fish, you've got to treat them as living creatures with phenomenal sensitivity. It's vitally important. So on the subject, in my opinion, buy top quality invest in top quality the fact that 12 foot leaders cost three pound 50 each look after them they'll last several days fishing and remember what do you pay for your fishing if you want to join my fishing club it'll cost you 1500 quid in the first year it'll cost you 400 quid plus every year after that what's well, 350 for a leader he knows it is and really it is false economy i'm going to give you a little gripe now that gripe is don't slag off other people's pleasure. I'll give you an example. There are a lot of river trout fishermen say, oh, rainbow trout reservoir fishing is just catching loads of easy stockies. It's not. If you want to go up to a friend's rainbow trout fishery north of Preston in Lancashire, I could take you there on days where Unless you are fishing a size 18 or 20 dry fly or nymph, you will catch nothing because it is so productive in tiny, tiny flies. I fished Barnesville, this friend's fishery, on World Cup final day in 2014 and I blanked. Why did I blank? Because the fish weren't feeding. Two weeks before one major World Cup final match was being played, I fish there. Avoid World Cup final. It's a great day to go fishing. And uh, I caught one brown trout and one rainbow trout. Why so little? Because they were feeding on minute, minute flies and the size 18 was the largest they would take. Rainbow trout fishing can be very, very difficult. By contrast, river trout fishing can be very, very easy. I've known days where it gets boring. It's too easy. And the other thing is, gets me is why don't people travel a little bit more people are quite happy to go and fish the same pond or the same piece of river week in week out and yet there is in the british isle some fantastic array of fishing let me give you an example if you like trout fishing if you're a trout fisherman you 
ought to go fish the Macalocks of the Outer Hebrides. They are fantastic. I mean, I've had trout over three pounds out of them. I've seen trout bigger than that. These are wild trout. These are not stockies. Wonderful. And then you go and say, I like salmon and sea trout fishing. If you like salmon and sea trout fishing, go and fish the salmon and sea trout logs of the Outer Hebrides. People think nothing of spending a grand on a uh, family week in, say, Majorca. Don't take the family to Majorca. Go and have a week's fishing in the Outer Hebrides. It'll cost you about a thousand quid and you will catch salmon and sea trout. Absolutely wonderful. I mean, the family can always go to Blackpool or the nearest holiday resort for the day. And then there's abroad. Again, people think, oh, I'm going to have to go places. Well, I've fished a lot of places. Don't go to Norway if you want to catch salmon. Norway is a rip-off when it comes to salmon. Why? Because the best two weeks to catch salmon in Norway are the first and second week of June, which are the opening weeks of the season. The rest of the year, it's absolute rubbish. Believe me, it is rubbish. Similarly, Iceland. Go to Iceland by all means. But if you can afford to fish the Ranga, fine. That'll cost you a lot of money. But if you go to some of these other rivers, which you see advertised for, say, three, four thousand pounds for a week, that's cheap for Iceland, by the way, that includes food, of course, then if you catch 1.1 grill, seems to be about the average catch for that three and a half thousand outlay. If you want to catch salmon, go to Ireland. Fish the smaller streams and you will catch grills in abundance. Pal of mine said to me, Malcolm, I want to catch a salmon. He was a trout fisherman. Fished the river at Eden, up in Apple, which is a tiny little stream. So I had a word with a pal of mine. We rented a cottage. We fished. That's a gusty, isn't it? Yeah. We rented a cottage and we fished a private beat, which cost us £60 a day, on the river Struel. Unfortunately, this was in June, end of June, the weather was very, very, very hot and sunny. And so it meant that early morning and the evening were the best time, because the rest of the time, the sun was in the summer's eye, the river was dead low. So it was a single-handed rod, we were sharing the rod, and Paul said to me, you start. So I went in the neck of this pool, and about fourth cast, showed him what to do, casting out, tweaking the fly back, salmon took, landed it, bashed it on the head, put it on the bank, five pounds, gave the rod to Paul. One of the problems there was that the salmon were on the far side and it needed a 20-yard cast and Paul wasn't used to doing 20-yard casts. So he was struggling a bit. So on the Monday I had, the evening I had another fish and Paul had nothing. And on the Tuesday I had three or four fish and Paul had nothing. But I, he was quite happy. He knew his time would come. On the Wednesday, it was about half past nine, the sun was beating down and everything should have stopped where this suicidal salmon took Paul's fly in the middle of the river, where it shouldn't have been. He played it out and was absolutely exhausted as a consequence. I bashed it on the head and Paul got, oh. On the Thursday, another stupid salmon took Paul's fly, not far from where it should have been, and he played it out and wonderful. And then he lost one on the Friday. But you see, how many beginners have had, in their first week of salmon fishing, have landed one salmon, never mind two, and lost one? Now, I had a friend who owned the beat below and said we could go fish there if we wanted, Frankie Elliott. Frankie said, I told him that Paul was coming, he said, this was yonks before, he said, tell your friend Paul that if he doesn't catch anything, I will give him back in cash what it's cost him to come. And on the Saturday, just before we were packing up, Frankie Elliott walked up the river. Are you Paul? So Paul said, yes. He said, I'm Frankie Elliott. I told Malcolm that, Mal that was American, that wasn't Irish. I told Malcolm, he said, that if you didn't catch anything, I would give you back in cash what it cost you to come here. And he put his hand in his pocket and took a huge wad of notes. Paul said, I caught two. Good, said Frankie, put the money back. Now that is great fishing. I remember two guys saying to me, we want to catch some salmon, we're just not catching enough. We see them catch very few. And I sent them to Ireland to similar piece of water. They had about nine in the week between them. That's great fishing, and that's what salmon fishing should be about. Small fly, single handed rod, go to Ireland, that's the best. I've been pottering on rivers in northwest England since I was about 13 years old, which is uh, very roughly um, 50 odd years. And um, 
things have changed in those times. I mean, I remember in the 60s when I was an undergraduate going up the loon in May and seeing salmon everywhere. And I remember catching two salmon and losing one, one late May day. The number of salmon caught in the River Loon this year, 2014 by May, about nil. Salmon runs certainly have declined on these northwestern rivers. You see, what's interesting, if you go across the River Tyne in Northumberland, the Tyne runs of salmon are tremendous now. And these aren't hatchery fish. These are fish that have been born and bred in the river and gone to sea and come back. But on our side, they're not doing. There's also possibilities. I mean, one possibility is they're being eaten by cormorants on their way out because we've got huge numbers of cormorants now on the River Estuary are all around the coast of northwest England, which we didn't have in the 1960s. It could be that there's something problem out at sea, but it, 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 there must be something that's affecting the population. And I feel sorry for somebody who's taking up salmon fishing now, because unless you're prepared to travel to somewhere like Ireland or go across to the Tyne and some of the better Scottish rivers, you, you know, you're going to be struggling to catch. The other thing that's coming in when I started fishing was that a lot of clubs used to stock their rivers heavily with brown trout. Now it's been decided by the Environment Agency that we're not going to be able to stop with ordinary brown trout. These ordinary brown trout were called diploids in that they can become sexually mature. They produce sperm and egg and will mate and produce offspring. The problem, they say, is that the trout that we put into a river will affect, I'll give you a quote, the genetic integrity of that river's trout stock. Now, there's evidence that that's not the case, that stock fish, even ordinary stock fish, even though they come into breeding kitchen, don't interbreed with wild fish. There's some evidence of that. But it's been decided that if you want to stock with brownies, then you've got to put in what are known as triploids. Triploids have an extra set of chromosomes in their cells, and that makes them unable to produce eggs and sperm. They are sterile. One of the problems with stocking with those is that their insatiable appetite, and they never go into breeding condition. So, when our trout start to spawn, say, at the end of October, November, or our salmon are spawning in December, the trout that would be in breeding condition spawned and resting after spawning wouldn't be. The triploids would be ready to feed. So they'd be going around saying, oh, this is good to eat. Oh, look, a few salmon eggs. That's lovely. Oh, look. And so you're getting the problem that those things would be taking the wild fish disproportionately. I'll give you an example of having seen this. Some years ago, I went to fish a tributary of the River Severn with an old pal of mine called Ron Braun. We were told when we were fishing it, this was in November for grayling, we must put back any rainbow trout we catch. We were told that there were triploid rainbow trout and they were put in there to provide the members of the club there with a little extra interest. So we fished away for grayling and in the middle of fishing away for grayling, I noticed in this very shallow water a great commotion going on. And that great commotion was some salmon spawning. They say this was November. I watched more closely and there seemed to be some other fish there as well. So I put a fly through the spawning salmon, hooked a rainbow trout, which I brought in, and the rainbow trout's mouth was full of salmon eggs and it was spewing salmon eggs when I squoze its stomach. So what you've got is a triploid, non-breeding rainbow trout feeding keenly on eggs of salmon laden. And that's what would happen if you had triploid brown trout in a salmon river or in a trout river. And so it means that one shouldn't stock them. And I think that's not a bad thing. You see, stocking is a largely a post-Second World War event. And it's done because, first of all, people expect instant gratification. They don't want to learn how to fish. They want to be able to go and catch one immediately. Well, as I told you before, in my first year I caught one chub. And that was not without trying. And in those days we were happy to work at it, to learn how to do it, to make errors and, and practice and so on. And it seems nowadays that people are not prepared to do that. And so that, yes, you've got to put stockies in. And the other thing is that people get bored catching small fish, apparently. Oh, we catch two and a half pound brown trout in our river. Of course, they were stocked at two and a half brown trout. And what you f do find is that if you go back in records, the average trout caught on rivers in northern England used to be eight inches. On short streams, nine or ten inches maximum. That two pounders were rare. And now they want to expect all the trout to catch to two pounders. They're not. They should be small. 
and that is what we've got to learn to accept again this presence of small trout they're the native trout not these artificially stupid big ones that have been artificially put in so that any plonker can catch them when I was a boy my first fly fishing was done for trout with three or four flies I always had an orange partridge which is a wet fly on the point I always had a water end blower which is another wet fly on the middle and top dropper I always had or nearly always had a snipe and purple sometimes I'd, I'd use a black magic or a Williams's favourite those flies caught me and I can show you my diary if you want from when I was young they caught me just about every trout that came near me I bumped into a gentleman I've told the story in The Floating Fly called Jack Norris who became my mentor with dry fly and again I tended to use about four or five dry flies for example I would use a Kites Imperial size 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 as a dry fly and trout would usually take it but you see are we fly tyres who go fishing or fly fishermen who need to tie fly to catch fish and there's a difference you see a lot of people can't take the simplistic approach where the trout will take that fly because it could be any insect it likes to eat no I've got to imitate that insect precisely and this has been going on for a long time for example Holford at the turn of the 19th 20th century has on one of his fly patterns eyes horse hair dyed van dyke brown now which trout looking up at a fly on the surface a real fly on the surface goes what colour is its eyes but they had to be I mean it can't even see its eyes because it's looking from underneath not on top but you get this I'll give you another example somebody was looking at one of my flies once and said oh your ribbing is not very even the wire or tinsel rib that I put round the body of the fly wasn't even. And I said to him, why? Well, the, the, the segments on a fly are... I said, no, that's not true. If you look at insect segments, you find that segments number one is narrow than number two, and narrow number three, that four, five, six, seven, eight are the widest, and then they go narrow end towards the tail end. So that in a real insect, they're not the same width. But you see, they have this thing. And the other thing is that people like to imagine that fish see things as they do and are as convinced and as tricky as they want to see them. Now, which trout, for example, living in a stream, flowing down at, say, four miles an hour, has time to go, ooh, how many segments has that fly got? Oh, I don't like the colour of that. It's not the right colour for the underside of the body compared with the top. It hasn't got time to do that. It hasn't. It's got to make a snap decision. And that snap decision is an automatic decision. But then you see they say it'll notice that little bit of you know, the light olive compared with the slightly lighter brown. So we've got to match those precisely. That's absolutely rubbish. And I'll give you an example of why it's rubbish. First of all, trout colour vision switches off during the late afternoon. So a trout only sees in black and white, say on a, a June evening when it's light to 10 o'clock, the colour vision of a trout may well switch off at 7 o'clock in the early evening. Then it only sees in black and white. People say, how do you know that? Because if you examine microscopically the eyes of trout killed and checked at different times of the day and night, that happens. And because you can see the cones that in the eye that pick up the colour are taken away so that no light can shine on them. And it sees in black and white. The precision, apparently, of vision in the dark for a trout is far away better than our vision. I'll give you another one. Some of the materials we see as black, on a real fly or as a fly time material, are not black to a trout, they're red, far red. It can see right into the far red, which to us is black. So when we look at, a, say, a, a black gnat that a trout is eating, we might say, oh, it's black. To a trout, it may say, it's deep red, or part of it is very deep red. Uh, so if you tie a real black material on that's not deep red, you're not matching the fly. And so there's a load of baloney talked. I mean, I've known people to say, you know, they can count six legs in daddy long legs. No, they can't. 
I mean, I know some kids in British schools can't count to six, but trout certainly can't count to six. And a good piece of advice, if you remember taking someone like that along, is to stick eight legs on, and then when it's caught two trout, it'll have the right number. But no, honestly, a load of baloney is talked about flies. I'll give you another one on salmon. Oh, you've got to fish this particular fly. Because everybody catches on that particular fly. Well, of course, everybody catches on that particular fly if everybody fishes that particular fly. You can easily simplify it. Let me give you an example of an easy fly. Put a treble fly hook in the vise. Tie a bunch of orange hair about two inches long sticking out of the back. Sort of hair? Doesn't matter. Trout doesn't go, oh, sorry, that's not polar bear. I'm not eating polar bear today. I'm only eating... That's rubbish. Whatever you fancy. Ideally mobile. Then put two or three little bits of twinkle alongside those hairs. Now wrap some orange thread up the hook and rib it if you want with some gold rib. You don't need to if you don't want. Then get an orange hackle and wind it round two or three times at the, and then finish it off. So this is a tail, a body, a rib and a hackle. Nothing. That is one of the most killing, simple flies there is. These simple material, dead easy. Tie a yellow version. Useful in the sea. On that fly, yellow version, I hooked 19 in one tide in the sea, in the River Bush estuary. That good. So, yeah, simple. Simple, simple flies. The important thing is your ability to present it properly. And as I said earlier on, people go, oh, I, this, oh, I'm casting better this rod. I know somebody who keeps buying a new salmon rod, and eventually he caught a salmon. And he's almost certain it was down to that last rod. It just happened he came across a suicidal salmon. But it's not a matter of how far you cast. I'll give you a daft one. Bruce and Walker, the rod company, had a timeshare on the River Nith. And Ken Walker, who was a lovely man, used to let me have it in October, November. And there were a couple fish there, had a timeshare rod, and the husband would go down the pool, and he would do his beautiful long cast. The fly would go out, and he'd lead it round. He'd take a stride, and he'd fly read it round. And and lead it round and he'd get to the bottom of the beat reel in walk back and say to his wife they are love she would go in i watched her do it little cast no there's no salmon there oh there's no salmon there little cast there no salmon there no salmon there she checked every possible place a salmon could lie in that piece of river and i went and went through their record book and the husband had managed one salmon in several years and she had salmon every year Nothing more dead than the female, is there? But she was the exact example of how one should approach it. It's not a matter of go casting and eventually Sam will grab hold. It's a matter of you're fishing for a fish. Don't worry about casting 25 yards. Oh, look how far I can cast. So what? Try and catch the fish nearer you by presenting the fly properly so it comes nicely trickling across over there. That's the art. Can't be that for a good straight talking dose of reality. Just what the doctor ordered. Speaking of which, my thanks then to Dr Malcolm Greenhouse for braving the elements here in Lancashire's beautiful Ribble Valley. Just a pity about the watercolour, which when we looked was like drinking chocolate. Otherwise we might have also managed to squeeze in a little bit of fishing time too. 